Hi, everybody. This is Mrs. Curley. We're going to finish our book today. I know it's been lots of weeks that we've been analyzing it, and today is the last day. We have three remaining really short vignettes as we conclude our house on Mango Street. Um, I did add the agenda for Tuesday that I forgot to add yesterday. That is the slide that kind of lists what's going on this week. So today is our last day with vignettes. And then there is a vocab quiz tomorrow over the ACT 10 words set one that's in quizlet.com. So you may want to review that a little bit today. Also, that quiz will be multiple choice and it will be tomorrow. And then there's going to be a larger quiz or you might want to think of it as a small test that's multiple choice over House on Mango Street that will cover anything in the whole book. And of course, you'll have access to use open notes if you want to since you're taking it from home. And it will be on Thursday. I'm assuming it'll most likely be around 40 unassisted points. Um, and then we'll be doing a couple lessons on thir Wednesday and Thursday over sentence combining um, and maybe shifts in text before we get into some short stories just to review the plot structure. So that's sort of my tentative plan. Another English teacher has made up a lesson that I'm probably going to use of hers about uh, both of those topics since they're already a little bit ahead of our class. Um, so that's sort of my general plan. And the two grades that are new going in this week are going to be those two quizzes. I got a little behind today. Um, and I'm going to try to get the TP cast stuff in as soon as possible. However, Tuesday is already kind of going to be crazy to, for me this week. I have to go up to the school and pack my entire classroom um, in one day. And so they're making us take everything down off the walls and pack up everything for a deep disinfecting. And so I'm going to have to spend at least probably half my day up at school tomorrow trying to, this is Tuesday, uh, on Tuesday, trying to get everything off the walls and packed and move all the furniture. So um, anyway, that's part of my requirements this week. I'm also still trying to contact parents who have requested a parent teacher conference this week and make phone calls. So it's just a lot of extra stuff as I get through this week. Um, so I'm trying to get everything graded as best as I can, but I know the TPK stuff is there. I'm getting to it as fast as I can. My goal is that we start Lit Circles in two weeks. Um, we only have four more weeks left of school. So so obviously things are rapidly wrapping up and I'm going to push out the book probably by the end of this week so people can already have the title of it and then a digital copy to start reading. Next week, I'll be putting out the roll sheets, a description of the structure and how it's going to work and a list of all of the groups that are going to be in each class period and the jobs each person will have for week one, week two, week three. And then we'll already be starting the following week, which is like in two weeks with the first third of the book. So since we're kind of on a pretty tight time frame, since we're going to be meeting the last three weeks of school once a week, it looks like um, to be able to get through the novel before summer, um, you might want to start reading it on your own as soon as I push out the PDF link. Um, the title is A Separate Piece by John Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. And if you want to order a paperback version to have it in a non-digital format, then you would need to do that on your own. We're not going to be able to issue any copies um, through the school because we're in quarantine. So the only version I can give you is just a digital copy that you'd have to read on screen. And if you don't like that kind of version and you prefer the actual physical book, then you'd need to get it yourself. It is readily available as an AP or classic novel in at Barnes and Noble or Amazon or any other bookstore. Okay, so let's go back and we're gonna finish really quickly the three last final vignettes from our book, um, which I hope you've enjoyed. It's my favorite book ever, not just because I teach it, but I think across all time of most books I've read in my life, this book has greatly impacted me and really changed the way I've seen things in my own life. Um, and really impacted me. Um, and so Alicia and I talking on Edna's Steps is the first vignette, and it brings back Alicia. So if you remember Alicia, it was the same character in Alicia Who Sees Mice. She's the college student who is trying to break away from inheriting her mama's rolling pin and most likely had an abusive father because she was scared of nothing but four-legged fur and fathers. So Alicia and Esperanza just briefly have a short conversation sitting on Edna's steps in another apartment, like on the street. And remember, Edna is Ruthie's mother, and we saw her before in another vignette as well. So this is on page 106 to 107, if you want to follow along. And this is Alicia and I talking on Edna's steps. I like Alicia because she once gave me a little leather purse with the word Guadalajara stitched on it, which is home for Alicia, and one day she will go back there. But today she is listening to my sadness because I don't have a house. You live right here, 4006 Mango, Alicia says, and points to the house I'm ashamed of. 
no, this is not my house, I say and shake my head as if shaking could undo the year I've lived here. I don't belong. I don't ever want to come from here. You have a home, Alicia, and one day you're going to go there to a town you remember. But me, I never had a house, not even a photograph, only one I dream of. No, Alicia says, like it or not, you are Mango Street, and one day you'll come back too. Not me, not until somebody makes it better. Well, who's going to do it? The mayor? And the thought of the mayor coming to Mango Street makes me laugh out loud. Who's going to do it? Not the mayor. Okay, so very short vignette, but it does have several significant things in it. Again, remember that Alicia is reminding us, Bronza, that Mango Street is her home. And that's sort of been our running motif of what defines a home. And she's been running away from this idea for the whole book from the very beginning when she said, I have to have a house, one I can point to, and this is not it. And here at the end, she's even saying, um, I have to, I can't accept that 4006 is my house. Uh, when Alicia says she points to the house I'm ashamed of. So she's still fighting that acceptance that this is her upbringing, that even though she maybe doesn't like it, it has shaped who she is. And she says, I don't want to come from here on page 106. So again, part of the struggle of this book is that Esperanza has to accept who she really is. She has to accept her identity. And like all of us, we do have to accept where we come from, who our parents are, the tragedies that have impacted us along our way. Um, we can't create a new character and say that we are someone we're not. And all those challenges that all of us go through make us who we are. And even if we've had painful experiences, uh, a broken home, you know, uh, you know, an alcoholic relative, or we, have, you know, maybe had a failure with a school class, or we've gotten cut from a team, or we have a disability, all those things are things maybe we'd like to forget about or we want to hide from people, but they also ultimately shape us and are part of our identity. And I think what Cisneros is saying in this vignette is that Esperanza is not there yet in this chapter, but she needs to understand that running away from Mango Street is not going to give her closure. It's just going to have her be running from her past. The way that she's going to find peace is by accepting those things that she's had to experience, accepting that she grew up in, as an impoverished person. I grew up with very little. I grew up with missionary parents and got one present at Christmas. I grew up being the kid in high school that had no car, that pushed a grocery cart to and from my apartment in college and got laughed at in front of the fraternity row houses and called bag lady. I had those experiences personally. Now at the time, did I want them? No, they were horrible, they were humiliating. But now looking back on them, I tell those stories because they made me who I am and it really shaped a lot of my identity to not be raised the same way other people were, to have to work for everything that I got and to learn to appreciate it. It taught me humility. It taught me not to be embarrassed and to still hold my head up despite obstacles or despite not being as materially successful as other people. So Esperanza still has not accepted that Mango Street is who she is. And so she's struggling with this view of herself. And Alicia says something very similar to the three sisters in a previous vignette and says, one day you'll come back too. And again, that's almost identical to what the three sisters had said. And um, they said, um, you know, uh, when you come back is what they had said. Uh, on page 105, when you leave, you must remember to come back. And then Alicia says, one day you'll come back. And so both the three sisters and Alicia have confirmed in these two vignettes that she is going to leave. They didn't ever say, if you leave, they say when, which is much more definitive, but they both have now said, when you come back. Now, right now, her response at the end of the chapter is to laugh and to say, not me, I'm not coming back till somebody makes this better. And Alicia reminds her, who's going to do that? And the mayor? And of course, they're thinking this mayor of Chicago that seems like this nebulous character that doesn't have any personal attachment to a ghetto neighborhood in the south side of Chicago. And they're thinking, no, the mayor doesn't care about our neighborhood. And then I think at that point, you begin to realize if her neighborhood or a neighborhood like this is ever going to be improved, the people who do that most likely will be the ones that love it. And the people who love it are the ones who lived there. And so maybe the mayor or the government isn't ever going to fix Mango Street, but maybe she could. And again, remember, the idea is not that she's going to come in and rebuild all the houses or do anything like that's going to be unrealistic. But just like many other people in our country have done, there have been people who have gone away, become successful and educated and then come back and like 
uh, many professional sports stars, for example, have done this, gone back to their hometown and given scholarships, rebuilt a community center, uh, you know, rebuilt certain historic sites, put in a park, gave scholarships, you know, built a private school for underprivileged kids that they can go to with free tuition. I mean, there's lots of ways to make a difference in a community. It's not like she's going to come in and rebuild Chicago or anything that grandiose or unrealistic. But again, she could make a difference in her neighborhood if she went away and actually became an educated person with a good career and she had a way to raise money. So again, that's where the chapter ends with her just kind of ruminating and thinking over that idea, who's going to do it? And that's sort of that rhetorical question that we're thinking she probably needs to be the one to do it because nobody else in this book has been able to get out of Mango Street. Even Sally, she left and still got trapped again. So if anyone's going to be able to do it, it has to be someone who can truly be free. So let's go on to the next vignette, which is A House of My Own. And this is one of my favorite chapters. Personally, it really has impacted me a lot as I'm currently in A House of My Own. And I read this um, a year ago and it just completely changed my life. This is where she defines her dream and her dream has changed so much from the beginning of the book. And if you remember in the first chapter, when she says on page four and she talks about her dream house, she said that she wanted one that would have real stairs and a basement and three bathrooms and be white with trees and a great big yard and grass growing and no fence. And now we get to go back to her idea of a dream house when we have this idea of a house of my own and it's now really different than what she thought of at the beginning of the book. And we know it's been about a year of time that has passed because in the last vignette, uh, she said to Alicia, shake, I, I shake my head as if shaking could undo the year I've lived here. So in the course of one year, this is now her new dream house that she envisions. And it's nothing like the dream house from chapter one. So we need to figure out what's changed and what does that show about her? Page 108, a house of my own, not a flat, not an apartment in back, not a man's house, not a daddy's, a house all my own, with my porch and my pillow and my pretty purple petunias, my books and my stories, my two shoes waiting beside the bed, nobody to shake a stick at, nobody's garbage to pick up after, only a house quiet as snow, a space for myself to go, clean as paper before the poem. Now that is probably the shortest chapter in the entire book, and as you can tell, there's so much uh, use of figurative language. We have alliteration. We have the repetition of my seven times. We have intentional fragments, which means not full sentences, not a flat, not an apartment in back. It starts with intentional fragments. Um, we have a simile, only a house quiet as snow. We have another simile, clean as paper before the poem. So let's go through a couple of the notes about what does she really want now and how is this really significant? To start with, but there's nothing about the size or the style of this house mentioned now. In the first vignette, it was much more about the color, the yard, the number of bathrooms, the conveniences. This could just be a tiny cottage somewhere. She just says it. she wants it to be all her own. And that's all that matters, not that it be rich or wealthy or luxurious. So I think it's really significant to show that she's no longer as concerned with material things. And she's more concerned with contentment and her writing because her writing is really mentioned a lot where she mentions things like, um, clean as paper before the poem. So she continues to mention my books and my stories. So it's really a place where she can create and make the craft of writing come alive and where she can feel peaceful, but it doesn't really matter anymore to her maybe what it looks like or how big it is. She also uses the word my, which is a possessive pronoun seven times. And again, we know that when repetition is used, there's intentionality. And obviously she's trying to show my, 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 not in a selfish, greedy way, but in a way to really show ownership because she's never felt that she really had anything that was hers. She always lived in her parents' house and then she expected to go into a husband's house. And so now she's saying, that's not what my dream is. My dream is to have my house. And so she says, my pillow, my pretty purple petunias, my books, my stories to show that she wants to be able to have freedom. And notice she says, my two shoes waiting beside the bed. I don't think I put this in the notes, but again, that kind of shows the idea that she can go where she wants to go and there's only her shoes and not anybody else's. So maybe she lives alone in the house. And also the fact that she has the freedom to travel and to leave because you put on shoes when you go outside. And we're thinking about all those other women who are trapped like Raffaella and Sally who are not allowed to go outside. So the idea that she gets shoes and that she can go is really important as a symbol in this book. She mentions at the very beginning, like on the second, first and second line, not a man's house, not a daddy's. 
And again, that also shows that she doesn't really want a, a husband. A man's house would maybe be a house that the husband owns, like Sally is living in a man's house. A daddy's house would be maybe that she still lives with her parents. She doesn't want either of those because she doesn't want someone being able to have the authority to maybe make decisions for her. Now, I'm not saying that, of course, that she, that marriage is wrong or marriage is bad. I truly believe in it. Um, but again, in this particular novel, I do think it's interesting that this might be some of the, the author's personal perspective. She did say she wrote what she knew. And Sandra Cisneros has never married in her lifetime. And so possibly because she has lived a life as, of a single woman, completely independent, not relying on a relationship, she kind of transferred maybe those feelings of that to her protagonist. I'm not really sure, but that's just a similarity that I saw. Um, so as we end this vignette, again, we can see that her maturity now is no longer that Esperanza desires a material house. She just desires peace and a place that's hers and it doesn't have to look a certain way or be a certain size. I think we can really see a lot more peace as far as the mood in this vignette than we did at the beginning where she was so uh, stressful, stressed about this dream house and anxious and sarcastic about, yeah, sure, I'm going to get that house. That's what they say when they play the lottery. And she was very sarcastic and kind of snarky about it. And now at the end, it's just very simplistic. We just get to see that it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be two story. She doesn't mention needing a certain kind of inside stairs. She just wants a place of peace and safety, a place to write. And that seems very attainable. Now, the last chapter is called Mango Says Goodbye Sometimes. Um, this vignette is also one of my favorites. I think you'll notice, and maybe you can comment on this because I'm not really going to say too much in the video because I kind of want some of you to bring it up and maybe your comments. I think you can make some connections to how the style of Essie Hinton was in The Outsiders because there's a very similar structure that this book uses for the beginning and the end chapters. So try to be thinking if you can even remember back that far what maybe be, would be similar with how Cisneros ends this book as similarly to how Essie Hinton ended The Outsiders. So let's go ahead and read Mango Says Goodbye Sometimes, our very final farewell to Esperanza, which I've taught this book, I think, 42 times now. I, as you can tell, I almost have it memorized and can quote back quotes from other vignettes. And my book is worn and tattered and taped together um, down the spine with all my notes. And it's actually probably going to need a new one next year because it's actually ripping uh, in, the, in the spine now and falling apart. But this book... Um, has been like my journal and I've written notes in Esperanza by the end of the book is my friend. And I hope that if this book didn't captivate you to feel that way, I hope one day you do find a book where you can identify with the character so much and really enjoy their storyline so much that you feel like you traveled the journey with them because that's an amazing way to connect to writing. Um, and it will always maybe help you remember the feelings that you had about the book. Um, not all books will do that. Not all the books that I read do that for me. But in this book, when I get to the end, regardless of how many times I've read it, I feel like I'm saying goodbye to a dear friend and that Esperanza has journeyed so far th through this book and come so far. And this is where she tells us goodbye. Mango says goodbye sometimes. I like to tell stories. I tell them inside my head. I tell them after the mailman says, here's your mail. Here's your mail, he said. I make a story for my life. For each step my brown shoe takes, I say, and so she trudged up the wooden stairs, her sad brown shoes taking her to the house she never liked. I like to tell stories, and I'm going to tell you a story about a girl who didn't want to belong. We didn't always live on Mango Street. Before that, we lived on Loomis on the third floor, and before that, we lived on Keeler. Before Keeler, it was Paulina. But what I remember most is Mango Street, the sad red house, the house I belong but do not belong to. I put it down on paper, and then the ghost does not ache so much. I write it down, and Mango says goodbye sometimes. She does not hold me with both arms. She sets me free. One day I will pack my bags of books and paper, and one day I will say goodbye to Mango. I am too strong for her to keep me here forever. One day I will go away. Friends and neighbors will say, what happened to that Esperanza? Where did she go with all those books and paper? Why did she march so far away? They will not know that I have gone away to come back for the ones I left behind, for the ones who cannot get out. So that's the ending. And I find it a very satisfying ending, a very happy ending to a very tragic story where we get to see that she is going to leave. She's not leaving that day because she's not 18 yet. She's obviously probably going to finish school, but that she has this belief by the end of the book that she has a calling on her life and that all those things that we heard at Lupe say, where she said, keep writing, it will keep you free 
where the um, three sisters said, you must come back for the others, where Alicia said, uh, again, you live right here. You like it or not, Mango Street is you. Man um, you are Mango Street. And she finally accepts that is her destiny and her identity. And she stops running from it. And much like the vignette where she first thought about helping others, she realizes that her destiny is tied up in Mango Street and that it's not to go away forever, but it's to go and come back to make a difference. So again, the paragraph that starts, we didn't always live on Loomis Street, should remind you of the very first chapter. So if you go back to chapter one, which was titled like the house on Mango Street, it starts, we didn't always live on Mango Street. Before that, we lived on Loomis. Before that, it was Keeler, and then it was Paulina, and before that, I can't remember. She starts the exact same way in this conclusion chapter, and then she changes the wording by page 110 by saying, instead of what she hated the most, it's what she remembers the most is Mango Street. And so we can see her tone by the end of this book is that of maybe respect for what Mango Street has taught her rather than a resentment that she was dragged there by her parents and she can't wait to leave and hates it desperately. So again, I think, you know, when she says, what I remember most is Mango Street, the house I belong but do not belong to is a super transformative sentence because she actually accepts the fact that she belongs on Mango Street, not forever, but that Mango Street made her who she is and she accepts that. So again, um, she tells us that she's gonna become a writer because she tells us in this chapter, I put it down on paper and she does go back in our memory to Aunt Lupi saying, keep writing, it will keep you free. And we can imagine of all the things like the abuse in the Red Clowns chapter and the things she has to process that writing would do this for her, maybe much the same way that this Esperanza is actually the voice of the author and talking to us through her writing about how it helped set her free. Um, she does say that she is going to be able to leave Mango Street and that Mango Street cannot hold her there forever but that it will set her free. And she does believe now she is strong. I and mean, I think throughout the book, we've always seen her doubt her strength and call herself skinny or seem like she's weak. But in this chapter, we begin to see that she's getting that self-confidence. And she says, she cannot hold me with both arms. She sets me free. One day I will say goodbye to Mango. I am too strong for her to keep me here forever. One day I will go away. So she sounds so much more confident in this chapter. Like she sort of just knows her destiny. And I just love that, that this Esperanza who thought she maybe wanted to be Marin and then she wanted to be Sally and then she wanted to be the girl who was out bad at night. And all of us were thinking, what are you doing? Why do you like Sire? He's such a punk. Don't do this Esperanza. And we all were so worried. I think now we can breathe a sigh of relief and realize she's gonna be okay. She knows who she is. And if you know who you are, then you can withstand any of the trials and the temptations that come your way. So she tells us she is going to pack her bags and that she will say goodbye because she does obviously have to go off to college is most likely what's implied by that. And then she says her goal at the very end is that what they will not know is that I have gone away to come back. And that's her whole purpose, not to go away to run away, not to go away to pretend she never lived there, not to go away to be ashamed and refuse to tell people she ever lived in the south side of Chicago, but instead to go away with the whole purpose of coming back to change the lives of the people like Minerva, like Raffaella, like Sally, who are trapped and cannot get out the way she was blessed to be able to. So the ending of the book fulfills the prophecy of the three sisters. Esperanza sees that her life is going to be helped spending others, helping others who don't have the ability or the ease like she did with her intellect to be able to get out. Because when the three sisters told her that, they said, when you leave, you must remember to come back for the others. The, uh, uh, again, they said, um, you must remember to come back for the ones who cannot get out as easily as you. Um, and so Esperanza now is going to fulfill that. She realizes, I think, by the end that peace and true freedom is not found in running away from who you are, not running away and forgetting you didn't have an experience, but instead embracing it and realizing that you can be thankful even in the hard times because those things make you who you are. And that true peace and contentment is actually found in helping other people. And that's her goal to come back for the ones who cannot get out, come back for the ones I left behind. So I hope you enjoyed our book. I hope you enjoyed my favorite book. Um, I enjoyed sharing it with you. I wish it could have all been in person, but I hope this was a good substitute because I do feel like I talked through everything similarly um, to what I would have said in class to you. But unfortunately, I know the discussion component was not quite as rich as it would have been to talk about it with our classmates. 
Um, but we did the best we could. And I really hope that this is a book you're going to revisit later in your life in high school or college. If you own it, put it on a bookcase shelf, pull it back up and out in a couple years, read it again for an independent reading assignment, and you're going to get a whole new level of meaning from it because it's one of those books that after 42 reads, I still get so much out of it every single year. So thank you for sharing my favorite book with me. Um, I hope you enjoyed this um, and I hope you can post a comment or question to kind of close out our Mango Street discussion. So whatever you want to comment about today, you can go back to anything about the book that you want to say as we're finishing and concluding it. And I'll be looking forward to reading your discussion comments. Have a great day.